Hey, welcome to Scooby-Topia. Last time on the channel, we looked at the penultimate movie we needed to cover from the seven movie lineup of Scooby-Doo's What's New Era of direct video Films. That means it's finally time to break down and discuss the final film at long last, Scooby-Doo and the Samurai Sword, and see where this era came to a close before it was rebooted with Abracadabra-Doo. <laughs> Scooby-Doo and Shaggy, two fearless warriors. Looks like our reputation precedes us. Join the mystery gang as they take on Tokyo. Like me, ow! Talk about a kung fu cat fight. I didn't have much of anything to say about the film cover before, chill out, but I do have at least a little discussion and fun going for us this time. And after this, my blood contract I signed to cover all seven of these movies in some shape or form will finally be over. Like chill out, I had this on DVD as a kid and watched it, but like that one, I also found this movie really boring and just couldn't get into it, only watching it once. I found myself staring at Shaggy's hairy leg on the cover more than anything because of how unusual it was to see. I didn't watch it again until early 2020 during a really dark time in my life. Not because of the pandemic, but before that. And I found it more interesting than as a kid. Kind of silly, but still probably not in the ways intended. And it was definitely still on the boring side for me overall. It's not a highlight of the period for me. And I think it was the right time to retire this era and reboot things, quite literally passing the torch in many ways after. Let's get into it. The all new movie, Scoop we do with the samurai sword. Look for it only on DVD. Scooby, Scooby, Scooby. Scooby-Doo and the Samurai Sword, the 13th overall DTV Scooby movie, as well as the 7th and final of its era, was released during the spring of 2009. I was still in elementary school by this point. It seems like it was probably finished in 2008 with Goblin King and just got pushed back though, allowing that one to be released during the Halloween season. I get it, I bumped my video on that one out of order to do sooner for Halloween myself. It had been 3 years since the show proper had ended, so this was the last breath for that era in general before it was finally sent out back. It was also the end of something much bigger for the overall franchise. In my Monster of Mexico video, I covered Casey case him leaving and eventually returning to the role of Shaggy, and that even by then his performance in the role wasn't quite what it used to be due to his age. Six years after the release of that film, Kaysom finally retired from the role officially after four decades, likely being 74 to 76 at the time of his last recording, making this film his final time ever voicing the character. He would of course still go on to voice Shaggy's father in the first season of Mystery Incorporated, but his failing health and hauntingly tragic end of his life ensured that we said our last goodbye to an old friend with this film. The rest of the cast is as you might expect. There are definitely some guest voices you'll recognize if you watched anything animated in the 2000s. I am sorry, Takagawa-san, but I, I got distracted. Kenji shares a voice with Vincent Wong from an earlier What's New episode, and more notably with Ling from Disney's Mulan. Do you know what I like most about Legends? New chapters are being written all the time. You definitely heard Matsuhiro's actor in shows from Teen Titans to American Dragon Jake Long to Hi Hi Puffy Amiyumi, many of which are relevant here. Thank you, most honored friends. George Takei's The Old Man Samurai at the end, which is par for the course every other movie with any Asian characters from the 2000s to now basically finds a way to fit him in. Kevin Michael Richardson, aka the Black Samurai in the film, is in everything. What's really interesting for me is who's doing double duty. Your opponent will always attack when you least expect it. I sometimes wish I could be a member of the Scooby Gang too. The highly talented Kelly Hu is voicing not only Daphne's from Yumi, but also Miss Minimoto. Kelly is another very familiar voice to most, having voiced Jade slash Cheshire in Young Justice and Catwoman Hunted, Stacy in Phineas and Ferb, and countless other appearances in TV and film. Like with casting her as her own mom in Young Justice, I think it's actually very distracting to have her voice two characters that are together a lot of the time. She has a very distinct and beautiful voice, and I can easily tell that both characters are her despite her trying to disguise it, which is really distracting as a choice for two equally important roles. The setting of the film, meanwhile, is the real interesting thing to look at here, and not just because this is the first movie without the Mystery Machine, which would have been pretty hard to drive to Japan, I guess, though they've done it before. See, one thing about the 2000s, which this hit the very end of, was that American pop culture was very obsessed with the culture of Japan. Remember the How to Draw Manga books everywhere? During this period, anime really started to enter the zeitgeist of American culture. Dragon Ball, Inuyasha, Naruto, Death Note, etc. It never really went away and has only become more mainstream. Just look at how I live. No, really. How many thousands of dollars in anime Blu-rays and DVDs and figures have I spent the last decade? Who am I? Manga, music, fashion, and video games saw the same increase in popularity and interest. Many shows aimed at kids who especially were into the seemingly new fad of anime interest would see episodes featuring samurai, ninjas, or other cultural aspects incorporated to try and catch their eyes. Some shows would even go full force like Samurai Jack with its characters and setting, or Teen Titans which directly was made in anime style with a theme song performed by Japanese pop duo Puffy Amiyumi.
A year later, the aforementioned Hi Hi Puffy Yami Yumi animated series would debut with fictional versions of that same pop duo. Adult series The Boondocks a year after that would also feature an anime style. Avatar The Last Airbender and subsequent series entries has probably been the longest lasting to take on the style in this period and remain widely popular. And that's just the tip of the boy in the iceberg when it comes to these shows. Given how many animated properties were obsessed with trying to get in on the newfound popularity with the younger generation, it was only a matter of time before we saw Scooby travel to Japan again for some of that action. As mentioned in my Dynamo video, he was actually going to go to an anime convention in a scrapped version of one of the later films, but alas. As is, I think the attempt here is, well, out of touch. Very goofy and out of touch. Some people feel a little racist, and I guess maybe a couple of moments low-key, but I think it just doesn't know what it's doing. It's not trying to be or doing anything malicious, though that doesn't excuse anything weird. I don't think it's anywhere near as bad as Aloha in Missing the Mark culturally, for example. I really don't want to start that war in the comments after the last two videos to have dealt with that. And by the way, no hate to the lovely writer who carried most of this era on his back and was probably tired. The film does have a lot of obvious cultural inclusions, such as the gang seeing the statue of Hachiko, which everyone knows the story of. Hachiko's not a person, he's a pooch! The story of Muramasa and Masamune is based in real Japanese mythology. There's a potential reference to Hayao Miyazaki's anime film, Spirited Away, etc. We might as well get into breaking the film apart to see what I mean. Scooby has been to Japan other times, as I said, from the Scrappy era, which was a very funny episode, to more recently in Guess Who, ironically in the Mark Hamill episode for some reason. But we're going to keep to the specific 2000s movie case. Unfortunately, the only bonus feature on this movie is a featurette about martial arts that's not really about Scooby and kind of boring, so we're skipping it. On to the next attraction. The movie opens up in Tokyo, Japan, where we go to the Museum of Cultural History. Tenji, who of course has his hair dyed pink because he's representing Asian people in American culture in the 2000s, is working hard. <laughs> when a shadow and an open window distract him, and then I guess he and his boss Takagawa suddenly start speaking English for no reason. I am sorry, Takagawa-san. As Takagawa complains about too many distractions everywhere, Kenji's dragged off and told about the Black Samurai. Sogoi. Takagawa feels the samurai, the most fearsome warlord in Japan's history, could save the museum. Unfortunately, smoke fills the room as the spirit of the warlord seemingly possesses his armor, taking his sword which he easily defeats Kenji with. That's what she said. And you know what? I, what was that? Okay. James. Anyway, the ghost flies out and that's that. We see some of the Battle of the Samurai during the credit visuals, which is cool I guess. Then we get this cool shot of the gang arriving at Shibuya Station. And of course the boys find a vending machine of Scooby Snacks immediately. Daphne's friend Miyumi says to meet them at the Hachiko statue as mentioned earlier. And I'm surprised Velma has to look up who he is, because I've known about him as long as I can remember even before this movie. I have to say the statue in this really doesn't look like the real statue or Hachiko at all though. Whenever it pops up in anime, it's always so on point, so it just looks sad here. After Scooby's Selfies, Yumi steps out to finally meet her friend face to face, wishing she could be part of the gang, for which Shaggy offers up his spot. They do assure him they're not here for a mystery this time, but, you know. Yumi describes the tournament they're here to see Daphne compete in, using some ominous terminology about how Miss Minimoto runs her academy, and they head off in an incredibly expensive aircraft. It's self-driving as Yumi points out how Japan is focused on the future of technology while old traditions are dying out. It is a bit weird for an American kids film to try commentary on the society of another country. <laughs> Hakagoa tries to warn Miss Minimoto, who simply laughs kind of as she's sure their school is safe from any ghost, commanding her guard Sojo to let him go as she points out his loyalty is only to her. Remember that. Thank you, random Fantasy Island reference. The gang land in the garden where Sojo forces the boys into uniform, and when Yumi tries to correct him and point to Daphne, her martial arts skills keys throughout what's new are finally seen. Sorry, Sojo, but I handle my own wardrobe. Miwi shows off the competition to everyone, while we head over to the start of the pre-tournament introductions where Miss Minamoto singles out Daphne as having the heart of a champion already, having beaten Sojo. She asks her for a demonstration of her skill, sending Miyumi out against her as it seems we might finally get a Daphne-focused movie. Could this be too good to be true? Well... With a camera keeping close watch, Miyumi pulls off Daphne's hairband and defeats her, but her skills still quite impress Miss Minamoto as she leads everyone to their feast. Unfortunately, Shaggy's bite is interrupted by the appearance of ninjas, and despite the efforts of the opponents we met earlier, each is defeated one by one as the ghostly samurai appears. We then get our first chase song, which is... it's, uh, interesting. Right. 
And another movie banned in Florida. I'm sorry, but that is the funniest clip ever. The boys get fully beaten up and fall right behind the samurai, where he's confronted by Miss Miniboto with the others, breaking into battle until she busts him and he has to run, successfully escaping with this prize. With the gang on to another mystery, they're introduced to Takagawa, who tells them the story of Muramasa and Masamune, which again is an actual piece of ancient Japanese folklore incorporated into the story the same way the previous films had used real supernatural folklore. Though this is one of the few times of these films we are pulling from actual historical events said to have happened, and turning them into a ghost, rather than a chupacabra or Nessie. Miss Minimoto explains the scrolls are needed to find the location of the Sword of Doom using a riddle, and that she's too clever even for the samurai, as he stole a fake while the true scroll remains safe. While the others try to solve the riddle, the boys goof off with origami, making Velma realize that's the clue they needed. Having Shaki make a dragon, they uncover what the scroll was meant to say, leading them to a temple that must hold the sword. Miss Minimoto entrusts Miyumi to go with them as her representative, and Takagawa as the translation expert, which makes Miyumi quite happy as she's not usually allowed to go so far, which is why Takagawa admires her teacher, still sticking to the old ways he prefers. The gang land to make it up the thousand steps of the temple, where inside, Shaggy accidentally gets things going, revealing a map on the walls leading to the sword. Takagawa makes another translation, suddenly running in fear as they find it's too late. Thankfully, they have Fred! We're from America! Takagawa deduces they're going to be offered as sacrifices, which, uh, interesting turn of events in the plot, again. And the boys know just what to do to make things tastier, getting the chief to take their place. Uh, this part is kind of questionable. I, I, yes. Thankfully, Velma is able to get her laptop and have their ride come pick them up. Where they see the waterfall is where they need to go next. The CG is getting a little dodgy between the aircraft and the bats, but it's not Aloha levels. The way this opened up looks pretty bad, though. After failed bribing, Yumi gets Scooby to join with 10 Scooby Snacks, and deep inside they find the sword. Daphne has a bad feeling, but Yumi knows what Miss Minimoto wants and remembers her teachings, but the removal triggers everything to crumble. The samurai appears, and a chase in the ruins begins, with some of the CG being a little distracting again, for old time's sake. My can't see a thing without my glasses! <laughs> That's funny! I can't see a thing with your glasses! The samurai eventually crashes, revealing the inside to be... Sojo. The gang explained to Miss Minimoto that he's been behind it all along, using some trickery to steal the sword for himself. And he would have gotten away with it too, if it weren't for you meddling kids. Sojo! <laughs> Sorry! <laughs> Jeepers! Jinkies! Dang! I still don't have a catchphrase! Don't worry, babe, you'll be holding that phone soon. Kind of sad for him that it took them so long to finally just do something about it instead of making jokes. So yeah, the gang didn't factor in that this was part of Miss Minimoto's master plan, full of robots. Ninja robots! Double cool! Uh, sorry, I, I geeked out there for a sec. I love Geek Fred whenever he comes out. The tournament was a facade to get the greatest martial artists around the world gathered to digitize their styles into her robots, lastly needing someone to solve the riddle where the game came in. Yumi remains loyal, leaving Daphne behind. As Miss Minimoto explains, she wishes to resurrect and control the real Black Samurai to fight the modern age. Yumi reveals she didn't know any more than she was supposed to become Daphne's friend, and Daphne really doesn't like Miss Minimoto's attitude, so she uses her skill to regain the sword. The boys escape with it while the others are locked away as punishment. Unfortunately, that means we have half an hour of dicking around Around with Shaggy and Scooby left, and we all know that makes for the best movies, and also the, uh, greatest chase song ever. Welcome to Tokyo Airspace. It's nice to meet you. What is your name? Like, I'm sorry, what the hell is this? What am I listening to? Oh my god, it's camp. You just don't get it, I'm afraid. The boys hide in a sushi shop and... Miso soup! Sounds perfect! <laughs> like, miso hungry! I would ask to be freed from my misery, but Shaggy made practically the same joke back when they went to Japan in the 70s, so he's at least consistent. They recognize the shop is modeled after the green dragon from the legend, which shop owner Matsuhiro seems fairly invested in. Suddenly, the ninjas break in, Shaggy reveals the sword to Matsuhiro's shop, and he breaks his own out against the robots. Though he kills most of the bots, the sword is stolen away, and Matsuhiro reveals he actually is a samurai. Back at the museum, Takagawa regrets being so harsh on the modern age and wants another chance, just in time for Kenji to open the lock doors. Nani? Takagawa-san! While Takagawa has a plan, so does Matsuhiro. The Great Mountain. 
Fuji-san. With him getting the voice to fix up the place. Well done, Tomodachi. He has them pass through the first of four gates as part of the legend to get to the green dragon and get the sword of fate. They make it to the gate of air, fall into a volcano, find the gate of fire, float into some water, find the gate of water, and come up to the grove of the dragon. They catch him up, asking for help, and he gives them some proper samurai attire. The dragon breaks out the sword of fate, taking the boys on his back as he realizes the legend must end where it started. Meanwhile, Miss Minimoto has her crew on standby as she deciphers the last mystery of the scrolls. With Sojo sent to the bridge, she promises Miumi fruitful rewards in the new world if she remains loyal tonight, which Daphne is still hurt to see. To everyone's surprise though, Miumi runs into the woods with the sword, for which Daphne gets so excited she exposes them and they have to start the action. Thelma is able to use magnetic pulses to crash the robots, but inadvertently crashes the electricity across the country. Miss Mirimoto begins the fight for the sword and... Ungrateful child! I was blinded by my loyalty to you, but now... I can see clearly! How dare you disobey me! It's just so distracting for me how obvious it is that these two have the same voice. Miss Mirimoto gets the sword to Sojo and things kick off. The real black samurai finally resurrected. She tries to explain that she's his master and, well, he laughs and throws her against the steps. Ouch. This has turned out like the prior film Goblin King to be one of the few movies with real ghosts. And it seems like the gang are in some deep shit as he controls them all. The boys arrive and are instructed to unsheath the blade so the dragon spirit can enter it, guiding them from inside. So they crash and walk up to the spook. The final epic battle between the Swords of Doom and Fate begins with Matsuhiro giving a pep talk on the roof, and Scooby gathers the power to break the Sword of Doom. He falls, and everyone is freed. They unmask him, revealing the corpse-like face underneath, and he thanks them for saving his spirit and their world, assuring their legend will be told forever before vanishing. The museum finally reopens with much more traction, and Takagawa debuts a new statue in honor of Scooby. Miyumi debuts her new style, which is very much 2000s fashion when it comes to an Asian character in animation. They even gave her the iconic blue hair streak. Can't forget that. She gives Scooby a thank you kiss, though. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was exhausting. I think Goblin King can finally rest easy knowing it's not at my bottom anymore. I know a lot of people enjoy this one, and I respect you. I can't find it in myself to do the same. For the first day of rewatching again and writing about it for this, I watched 12 minutes and I had to turn it off for the day. I was not strong enough. I actually took three days with breaks to finish it. Have you ever been really going through it and while in the middle of that tried to take in and make a watchable video about a movie you just really don't find fun or enjoyment in or want anything to do with at that time? Yeah, that's what I decided to do anyway, and I let it continue into private month. Kind of homophobic to myself. The movie isn't even that bad. It's really not that deep. I'll get into it in a minute. For some relief, why don't I finally rank the What's New Era films before we go on? I'm sure to the surprise of no one, my number one is Loch Ness Monster, which started the era and also my videos on the era. It remains one of my favorite Scooby films just in general, if not my favorite. I love it. Next is Where's My Mummy because I do love mummies, I think the villains are well executed, and I love the twist. I think it's just a very solid entertaining entry. Next, much as it has issues and and it does have issues, so I'm ranking it on how bored or entertained I am here. I'm not excusing the issues, it has issues, I know, I know, I know. Aloha is next for me. Is it partially because I want to marry Manu? Yes, and that's okay. But I do like the setting and characters here, and it's never boring for me, which is the cardinal sin. Next, it may not be everyone's favorite, but I do love Pirates Ahoy and always have. Using the Bermuda Triangle, the designs of the pirates, the fun characters and performances, this one is solid for me. Now we're down in the B tier, and to no surprise, it's chill out. Like I said, in the previous video, it's not really bad. It's just not really great for me. It could have done more with the characters for an even more solid product, and it's a little slow. It could have been so much better, and that's why it's a B tier. It could have been better, it could have, but I like it more now than as a kid. It's fine. In the C tier, this might be a shock. It's Goblin King. I'm sorry to everyone who loves this one. I want to see the vision. I just really don't ever want to watch it again, I don't think. But hey, it's not last anymore. In the final tier, you guessed it, it's Samurai Sword in an unexpected position. Let me just reiterate it's not because it's bad, it's really not, it's just boring as hell to me, both as a kid and an adult, which I think says a lot. I'd rather watch Goblin King again than this one, honestly. I truly had trouble getting through this video, but how do you feel about this 7 film era? What's your ranking? Surprise me. Okay, back to Samurai Sword. As I said, the movie really isn't bad, it's just the opposite of my cup of tea. I may watch anime every day, but ancient historical Japanese folklore puts me to sleep. I loved the Heike story, but it was a struggle to pay attention to because it's just not what I'm into. Stories about 
Samurai? Sorry, I'm asleep. Karate, martial arts, anything? I'm asleep harder. Basically, this movie is my personal worst nightmare, and even Scooby Doo couldn't save it for me. As for the actual quality, I think it did its best. I'm sure some things in here are a little of its time, like the first word, but it's clearly in an out of touch way and not malicious, as I said. So, like, you know, there's nothing in here that, like, I Love Lucy didn't do. The songs, the little drips of random phrases or words you'll pick up on after one episode of anime, the clashing of things, it's ultimately really funny to me how it's all thrown together. The acting is fine and standard, though again, Minimoto and Miyumi having the exact same voice is such a weird choice. It feels kind of lazy, with total respect to Kelly Hu, as I doubt it was her choice and she tried to differentiate them. The animation is standard and fine like the ones before it, with some iffy CG in minimal places and characters otherwise on model and fluid. Like, you're not gonna have any problems with the visuals of this movie, it's very, very solid. The story has some problems, though. This movie could have finally been Daphne's chance to shine. It even sets that up with the tournament and finally showing off her martial arts skill they had been leading up to throughout the era. But the movie just kind of forgets all about that after a point. This should have been her movie. She should have had the spotlight and be fighting the Black Samurai in the climax instead of the boys. Maybe have Miyumi join in with her in the battle against him at the end. Can't you imagine how well that would have worked for this story thematically with what was set up? There's no reason for this one to become a solo adventure with the boys other than Scooby needing the spotlight and getting that statue. The movie really feels like it just takes a turn and gets distracted when the boys leave on their mission, and it doesn't feel cohesive enough. So much of the movie feels like it set up bigger things and just didn't fulfill them, which Chill Out was also guilty of when it came to its antagonists especially. At least here, Miss Minimoto is genuinely a believably threatening villain, even if her twist as a villain is very obvious. I'll say it's disappointing, however, that she's defeated so easily and then we never see her again. We don't see her suffer any kind of consequences for trying to take over the world. Again, setting up without fulfillment. I checked again and we genuinely don't know what happens to her as best as I can tell. I do like Miyumi's art deciding not to betray Daphne in the end and follow her heart, though again, she and Daphne should have been leading the climax. At least she gets her happy ending, I guess. For Shaggy, while at least he gets some spotlight, I can't say this is the greatest farewell to Casey Kasem we could have gotten. And weirdly, in Europe, some sources say he was overdubbed by Scott Innes, though nobody can seem to find examples. And I'm American, so there, that's my excuse for not having them. But I mentioned it. It's a little sad that the What's New Era kind of feels like it went out on a pitiful note depending on how you feel toward this one. But by the end, it was definitely getting mixed reception from fans as each movie went by, and I think most can agree the reboot after gave us some really special movies, so it was the right time to say goodbye. It's a little bittersweet now to finally be saying farewell to talking about these now too, but there's always an end to a story as this film taught us. Well, here we are. It may have taken a couple of years, but this little mini-series is over. I can't say I'll miss it much, but it was a fun journey until, you know, it wasn't at the end here. If you stayed throughout the entire thing, all seven videos covering all seven movies, I would reward you, but I have nothing to give. In fact, I have stolen. Stolen away all your time. As for what's next on the channel, I know that question is present as well. Let me say it outright, I will not be covering every single movie I have not touched yet from the following reboot era. If I cover any more movies, it will be ones I really want to do and have something interesting to say about, and we'll probably try and mix things up if I can. Right now, I truly don't have plans and I'm not looking that far ahead yet. I know there's a lot of interest in me doing Legend of the Vampire after skipping it before, saying I had nothing to really talk about with it, and after these last two videos, I think it's much preferable to stick to ones I do have something to say about. But hey, maybe eventually I'll get back to it. I don't know at this moment. I hear requests for Camp Scare a lot, and I'd like to rewatch that one, so maybe that will be one that shows up someday knowing there's interest. However, I don't plan on taking actual requests for movies to discuss, there's just too many of these things. And as of upload, I don't want 100 know what the next video will be. I said at the end of last year, but videos for 2023 are just going to be more sparse. I can't realistically do another year putting out as much as I did in 2022 again. I literally do everything myself, writing, recording, editing, uploading, and it's a lot for one person. I need breaks for mental health and relaxing to keep things going. So if I disappear without a video for a month or two or more, who knows, that's why. You can probably still find me on Twitter or TikTok all day, every day if you want to make sure I'm alive, though I probably won't be talking about Scooby. I still plan on making more videos this year. I just want to be able to also rest, have a personal life I skipped out on for the channel last year, and put proper creative juices into things when inspired, you know? Anyway, what about you? How do you feel about the Samurai Sword as a movie? And what do you feel about the What's New Era now that we're at the end? You know, what's your ranking of the seven films, like I said? Let's get into it deep. I think that's all I really have to work with here now. Follow me on the socials if you want, like the video to make the algorithm happy because it hates me for the breaks I take now. Subscribe if you uh, want to be a resident of Scooby-Topia or some other gimmick between videos. I'll see you again next time, whenever that may be. Bye!